elevation at 330 nautical miles above the Earth. Thank you very much for the ride. Okay, and Adam Lafaccia, your moderator, rejoining you. And if you liked that video, you can actually locate that online, and we've just pasted that link into the chat box. And before we get started with today's session, we're just going to cover a few technical aspects of the room, but I just want to say a big thank you and welcome to all of you for joining us today for NASA's Amazing Space using Hubble Space Telescope images in the classroom. Once again, my name is Adam Lafaccia, and I'll be your moderator through the session today. And you may have noticed that there were some forms built into the website, and we hope that you took a moment to introduce yourself there. If you haven't, please feel free to, or take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box today. And I'm also going to launch a couple of interactive polls. We'd like to know a little bit more about you. And you'll see a poll appearing on the screen asking, what subject do you teach? And you can click on the gray bubble that best corresponds to the subject that you teach. And if you say other, please let us know in the chat box what area you teach in. And also, we're curious to know, what grades do you teach? And you'll see a second poll has popped up right next to that first one. We'd love to hear your responses. That's great. I'm seeing a mix today. Wonderful. So I'm just going to clear those off of our screen for now. And moving along, as I mentioned before, the chat box on the left side of the screen is your best way to communicate with us. And you can use that both to make comments and ask questions of our presenters today, and also to ask technical questions. So if you do have a tech issue, please let me know in the chat box and I'll respond to you privately to get those sorted out as quickly as possible. 
If for any reason you get bumped out of the online room and you're not able to ask me for help, you can always email our team at smithsonian at learningtimes.com, and they'll work to get you signed back in as quickly as possible. You may have also noticed that our colleagues over at WGBH are providing us with live closed captioning today. We hope that that's useful for you, but if it's distracting for any reason, you can click on a box in the top right corner and change that to no captions. And the conversation extends beyond the online room. Feel free to tweet with us using hashtag astrophotography. And we are also extending this community into the badging world with Smithsonian quests. And I'm actually going to turn the floor over to Ashley Naranjo with the Smithsonian to tell us a little bit more about those quests and badges. Thanks so much, Adam, and thanks to everybody for joining us here today. Uh, complementary to all of these online conferences are digital badge opportunities in the form of prompts for students to be able to explore connections to possible careers, skills, and what's going on in the world around them. So as you see up on the screen, there's a variety of different subjects. And they can all be found at smithsonianquest.org. One in particular that's associated with this session is part of a new uh, teacher for PD section of our Smithsonian Quest. And it's called the Teaching with Telescopes Badge. And we've added this for teachers as well as educators, um, so troop leaders, librarians, et cetera. Um, and this pr badge prompt allows you to try your hand at using the micro observatory tools, which we introduced in a prior session, and kind of think about how you might use these tools in the classroom. They're also shareable uh, through LinkedIn. We should also mention that prior to this conference session, we've had two separate sessions during the summer focusing on astrophotography and astronomy in the classroom. So there's an astrophotographer badge, which is available for students. Um, and you can find that also through smithsonianeducationconferences.org as well as smithsonianquest.org. In September, we'll be, have, we'll be joined by the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, which uh, is located in Front Royal, Virginia, as well as our friends down at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And as you're planning for the school year, we're kind of switching gears a little bit, but next session, We'll take a look at conservation efforts for frogs that are actually on the brink of extinction. So uh, that'll be Wednesday, September 11th, 2013 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, following that session in October, um, we'll be joined by the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. And they'll be focusing on a citizen science project uh, that can be uh, translated into a project for your own students in their own communities. Um, offering students a chance to have ownership and stewardship of the waterways in their region. And finally, one thing that I did want to point out, um, a very special collaboration conference series in November. On Wednesday, November 13th, we'll be joined by two fellow uh, government agencies for an interagency initiative of learning. And among these partners, uh, we'll have the diplomatic reception rooms of the US Department of State as well as the interpretation and education team from the National Park Service. And we'll also be joined by colleagues from the National Museum of American History. We'll be focusing on diplomacy and reaching agreements at the international, national, and local levels. So it's definitely a session you don't want to miss. And finally, um, like I mentioned, you can find all of these resources as well as additional resources on these topics at smithsonianeducationconferences.org and for more information about all of these different learning opportunities. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. And before we launch into the session, I would just like to touch one more time on the fact that this is the third in a series of sessions that we've done around the theme of astrophotography. And we do encourage you to go out and check those archives all of those sessions were recorded and are listed on the conference website. We started off with Understanding Astrophotography, Where Science and Art Meet, and followed it up with a session called Do-It-Yourself Astrophotography, Applications for the Classroom and Beyond. So if you enjoy yourself today, which we hope you will, then please go back and check out those recordings. We're also joined today by Mary DeSalt, who 
was a major part of our first two sessions and will be joining us in the chat box today. So you'll see her commenting in there. And we're actually going to have her jump on her microphone now and just say a quick hello and tell us a little bit more about the series. Thank you, Adam. Um, it's it's uh, great to be here at the third of this stellar summer triangle of sessions. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's been a great collaboration between the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and our friends at the Center for Di Learning and Digital Access and uh, developing these quests and badges for both uh, students and now for teachers with this Teaching with Telescopes badge. And of course, I love to work with my colleagues at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, so I don't want to take up too much more time so that uh, Dr. Frank Summers and Dan McAllister can uh, show everyone the amazing, uh, the amazing space uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope and ways that you can use them in teaching and learning. So thanks very much. I'll be in the chat box. Great. Thank you, Mary, and it's great having you join us again. Uh, now, as we're just about to kick off this session, I am just going to launch a couple more quick interactive polls for our participants. And we'd like to start off knowing, how would you rate your astronomy knowledge on a scale of 0 to 10, if 0 is no knowledge at all, and 10 is astronomy expert? And you'll notice you can click on those gray bubbles and your vote publishes right to the screen. And it looks like we've got a bit of a spread coming in already. And while you're answering that, I'm just going to launch one more. We'd also like to know how many people are watching this webinar with you from your location. So you might want to take the average if there's a few of you sitting at a table. Or feel free to just lean to the higher number. We like to see that too. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing everything from a 1 to a 9. So Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and great to see such a wide knowledge base uh, joining us today. All right, excellent. Well, I'm just going to clear that off the screen for now, and it's my pleasure to formally introduce Dr. Frank Summers and Dan McAllister, who have been gracious enough to both host us today at the Space Telescope Science Institute and to speak with everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Adam. That's uh, wonderful for you all to come here. Thank you, Adam. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Dr. Frank Summers. I'm an outreach astronomer at the, in the Office of Public Outreach here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And my colleague? I'm an education specialist. I worked in, well, elementary and middle school science, and here I am. And Dan and I have been working together for, well, basically since I got here uh, 12 years ago, haven't we? We've done lots of things. We've done a f quite okay. a few things. In fact, there's uh, one thing that we did that's rather remarkable. You've got <laughs> to tell them about it. Well, I don't know how remarkable it is, but it was a lot of fun. Um, if you look at this slide, on the left-hand side, you see the, uh, this, picture, this picture right here. That is myself, and there's Dan, and this is, what was her name, Sarah? She's the official official from Guinness World Records. Uh, Dan and I set the Guinness World Record for largest astronomy lesson this spring uh, at the South by Southwest conference in Austin, How Texas. Many people were there? It was huge. Five hundred and twenty-six people were in the corral. Wow. Although there are a bunch of people outside the corral, which we had to, we were trying to get in to yes. get even a larger number. Uh, so Dan and I have done a variety of things. You want to talk about this picture in the upper right? Well, we work together, but we also celebrate together. And as you can see, uh, this is a members of some of the members of the team, and we like to celebrate sometimes with our milkshake uh, celebrations. And that's we call it our milkshake it. research. R yes, milkshake <laughs> research. I think that's a good way to put it. We have researched milkshakes in uh, about a dozen states yes, we around the country. <laughs> Uh, and finally, this picture down here in the lower right, that is an astrophysicist on the red carpet at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Wow. One of the things I like to do besides working with teachers is uh, scientific visualizations. And I was the scientific visualization supervisor on the IMAX film Hubble 3D. And they had a NASA day at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And so I got there and we spoke about the work that we did on Hubble 3D in front of it absolutely a sold out house with the giant Oscar statues around the stage. It was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Okay, 
But that's not what we're here we're to talk about fun today. today. We're going to have a Absolutely. lot of fun today. Okay, okay, let's do it. All right. What we're really here to talk about today uh, is this telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. And we here at STSCI, we run the science program of Hubble. That means if you want time on Hubble, you got to come apply to us. All right. We run the archive. We release the data. All right. We tell the news stories about it. And people always ask, what makes Hubble so special? Well, if you want to know what makes Hubble so special, you take a look at this atmosphere. You see this atmosphere? that edge of the Earth, Hubble being in space doesn't have to look through that atmosphere to look at the objects in the universe. You know, we've all heard of twinkle, twinkle, little star, right? Well, we astronomers don't want the stars to twinkle. We want the stars to be absolutely perfectly still so we can see them at their highest resolution. So Hubble, with its vantage point in space, gets the clearest view of these objects. And, uh, well, we only have an hour, so I can't go through everything that Hubble has seen. But I'm going to give you a real quick rundown on a variety of objects that Hubble, Hubble has looked at. Okay? So, let's start in our solar system. Now, Hubble doesn't travel to the planets, right? And we've got these space missions that actually do, and they can get much better images. But what Hubble can do is Hubble has been up for 23 years and Hubble can monitor them and watch long-term effects. And what's really cool on this image is this is the planet Mars. And if you look down here in the Hellas Basin, right down here, okay, you can see there's a sort of brown cloud there. Well, this was in June of the year, and there was a dust storm forming inside the Hellas Basin. And when Hubble went back to look at it in September in this picture on the right, that dust storm had gone global. Mars's thin atmosphere allows for local disturbances to become these global dust storms. And this has happened several times in our, in our missions to Mars. And Hubble, with its vantage point here on Earth and its long-term mission, is able to monitor these things. Another thing that we looked at was we looked at Saturn. Now, this is a combined visible and ultraviolet image. Okay? The main image of Saturn is in visible light. But right down here at the poles, these bright glows at the poles are the aurora on Saturn. And we need to use ultraviolet light to see these. And of course, most of the ultraviolet light doesn't actually get to the ground, so we have to go to space to see ultraviolet. And because these are due to the solar wind, and Saturn is 10 times further from the sun than Earth is, you know, the solar wind should be 100 times less dense, 1 one hundredth the density. And so we weren't really sure how bright these aurora would be, and how variable would they be. And these three images were taken over the course of four days. And so we found that not only are they a very strong aurora on Saturn, but they're also much more variable than we had expected. And of course, we looked at Jupiter. Um, and Jupiter, we studied the great red spot here. But we have also got to see the formation taking some of these white ovals. And these white ovals combined to form a new red spot. This was the first time we'd ever seen the formation of a red spot. All right. And then in 2008, we actually saw the formation of a tiny red spot. Okay, if this is the great red spot, well, we called this one Red Spot Junior. <laughs> and this tiny one, well, we sometimes called it Baby Red Spot. But Baby Red Spot didn't last very long because it's on the same latitude as the great red spot. And over the course of that summer, it got caught into the vortex of the great red spot and dissipated. So these giant storms on Jupiter are really violent because you can see they even eat their young. All right. Uh, so um, we, do, we do more than just planets in our own solar system. One of the really cool observations uh, was this one. And this one, oh, it looks a lot like the Eye of Sauron from uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? All right? But it's not. It's actually a picture of a star form a lot. Actually, it's, 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 it's not the picture of the star form a lot. It's a picture of everything but the star form a lot. Form a lot would be right here in the center where we got this dot, right? But we've used a coronagraphic mass to block out the light of that star. Sort of like in the evening when you put your hand up to block the light of the sun so you can see the road that you're driving on, right? You're doing a coronagraphic mask of the sun. We're doing a coronagraphic mask of form a lot. And you can see this ring around here, this ring around it. And that is a dust disk around um, around foam lot, and it's a, it's a relatively thin ring of dust around it. And what was funky about it was that it was slightly off center. And you were expecting, and you were, we were expecting that, well, maybe there was a gravitational tug to pull it off center. 
And so we started looking to see if there was actually a planet pulling that ring off center. We found it inside that tiny little white box here, which we've blown up here. And this is where Hubble saw it in 2004 and 2006, confirming that it was on the correct orbit to be a planet around Fomalhaut. Now you say, well, that's fine. We've discovered 800 planets. But most of those planets have been discovered indirectly. We've been using the gravitational motions and the Doppler shifts and everything to in infer the existence of the planet. This is the first visible light image ever directly taken of a planet around another star. Okay, I don't have to say, oh, because of this and this, there's, I can tell you there's a planet there. You can see it with your eyes. And you know, the old seeing is believing, right? This is really cool stuff. All right, so we've got tons more to go on. I'm probably going too, too slowly, but let me go through a few more. Um, so we talked about stars, okay? Uh, this is a beautiful star cluster here. You can see the star cluster in the center, and it's a newborn star cluster. And these newborn star clusters have this incredible energy that streams out the ultraviolet radiation, the winds from these big stars. They actually eat away the nebula from which they were born. You can see these sort of elephant trunks here and here and on up on the outside here and here and over here. What it is is the winds and the radiation from these newborn stars are eating away the gas of the nebula. You know, stars, newborn stars actually destroy the stellar nursery, the gas clouds in which they are born. And we also have wonderful images of star clusters. This is a globular cluster called Messier 80. It's composed of about 50,000 stars all orbiting around each other. Uh, and the stellar density is so great that if we lived inside Messier 80, our night sky might look something like this. All right, well, it wouldn't look exactly like this this, but it'd be covered with this many stars, all right? A reason it wouldn't look exactly like this is that this image also showcases that Hubble doesn't see just visible light. It goes into the ultraviolet on the, sh on the short wavelength end and the infrared on the long wavelength end. And this was sort of a test exposure with Hubble after the last servicing mission to show off its ultraviolet capabilities where the, the, the stars that emit ultraviolet show up in blue in this image and the stars that emit in the infrared show up as red in this image and the ones that are just visible light, you know, they show sort of as, as white or yellow in this image. And so you can see the incredible diversity, the span that our new instruments can get going from all the way from the ultraviolet to the infrared uh, with Hubble's observations. But just the immensity of the stars inside these globular clusters. And let's see, let's go on to the nebulae. And uh, Valentina from Moscow is wondering if oh. you can just quickly uh, reiterate what nebula is it? Uh, the which nebula? The... I think she's talking about this one here. I believe so, yes. Uh, I think that's, I will find it and I'll, I'll get, it, get it into the notes, but I don't remember the exact name. It's got an NGC number. It doesn't have a nice beautiful name, unfortunately. Okay. So um, it's uh, got like an NGC 326 or something like that. Thanks. Okay, now this nebula, I do know this one's name. This, <laughs> this is a very this famous, famous nebula one. called the Helix Nebula. Um, and this is actually a dying star. Uh, we call these planetary nebula because when astronomers first looked at them, they thought they might have something to do with the formation of planets. Well, they didn't. We, we, had, we didn't have really good views of them. Uh, but we know that this is the death of a star, a middle-sized middle star like our sun. And what it does is actually blows off its outer layers, sort of like blowing a smoke bubble, uh, uh, a, a gas bubble into space. And so what you're seeing at the very center is the burned out cinder of the star right here in the core, and all of this gas around here is the outer layers of the star being blown off into space as it dies. Uh, it's really cool, and you get this sort of circular structure here, but in our next image, we have the butterfly nebula, um, and this butterfly nebula has a tight disk of gas around its center, central region, okay, and that constrains the outflow such that you get a hourglass shape. So you can see you've got one lobe up here, and one lobe down here, and the gas is streaming away from this dying star. And I, I mean, just the beauty of this image is amazing, you know, in terms of all, all the colors. Uh, some of those are due to the fact that we're observing in specific lines. This isn't exactly what your human eye would see, uh, but they, all the images, all of the data that goes into this image are direct observations from Hubble. Uh, some of them are in oxygen lines or in nitrogen lines, and, are other, and that's how we get a little bit more, more detail, more scientific uh, study of it. 
And then we have some planetary nebula like this one. This is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. All right, and you can see these multiple shells out here. All right, this one has had multiple outbursts, and it appears it's got you know jets of emission that are sort of spinning and wobbling around, creating this amazing structure in the center. So you know we can only hope that when our sun dies, you know it's going to do a planetary. It will probably go through a planetary nebula phase. We can only hope that it's as pretty as some of the ones we see. Now the really big stars, they don't do a planetary nebula they do a supernova explosion. And this is one of the most famous supernova explosions. It's called the Crab Nebula. Uh, and the Crab Nebula was observed to explode about a thousand years ago. Okay, it was a very bright star uh, observed by astronomers of the time in the sky that appeared and then went away. And when we look at that same place today, we see this. This nebula is basically the guts of the star blown out across space at millions of miles an hour, okay? This stuff has been streaming across space for a thousand years, producing this amazing nebula. And you can see all the filamentary structure. This is like a 30, 35 million pixel image where you can see all the detail and structure of the, of the star being blown out into space. And it will continue. And in the next image, We've got Cassiopeia A, which is another supernova remnant. This is the gas that has been blown out much, much further. This one is about 30,000 years old. And you can see the delicate structure of the gas that spreads out and goes across interstellar space. And the cool thing about this is that in the supernova explosions, that gas that is, is, is blown across space then becomes part of later neb uh, gas clouds that form new nebula in which stars are formed. So there's a cosmic recycling where the material from a star goes out and becomes part of the interstellar gas clouds, which then becomes part of the new generation of stars. Really. Now, you mentioned that some observations from a thousand years ago were used to uh, know what parts of the sky to look at. How common is that to dive into history to see what's actually above us now and how it compares? Well, we have a certain number of historical observations that we can follow up on. Uh, the supernovae are great, and because we had uh, Chinese astronomers recorded the supernova, uh, the crab supernova. It was also recorded that Native Americans uh, drew it on uh, some walls in the American Southwest. Uh, and so we're able to then say, all right, well, if they saw a bright flash in the sky, let's go look at that point in the sky and see, see what we, we uncover. All right, and that from that, we can deduce it was a supernova. We also have, uh, say, Kepler's nova, supernova in 1603, which Hubble, as well as the other of NASA's great observatories, have followed up. And um, a whole bunch of other observations that, you know, when we can look at them over history, and if there is something that we can do to follow up on it, um, we can uh, come up with new information, especially when you've got new technology, mm -hmm. which gives you not only higher resolution, um, better, uh, better imagery, but also in the 20th century, other wavelengths. We look at the same objects that uh, astronomers looked at 100 years ago, but now we can use radio and infrared and ultraviolet and x-ray and gamma ray, et cetera, and we can get totally new views and learn totally new physics about what's going on in these objects. I'm struck by how much detective work is done and how it almost seems like you're returning to the scene of the crime with, with new technology to, to figure out who done it. That's exactly it. I mean, I always consider this as astronomy is like the ultimate Sherlock Holmes because we don't actually go into the lab and slice and dice up a supernova. We only get the light that comes to us from the universe, and we have to untangle the story of what's really going on, you know, hundreds to thousands to millions of light years away uh, by just dissecting and unraveling the story from the light. It's amazing. Okay, let's move on from nebulae. Okay, now we're going to go up to the scale of galaxies, because there's some really energetic things that happen in galaxies, too. This is a galaxy called Messier 82, and it's got a star burst going on in the center. You can see all of this red material up here coming up and down. There's so much star formation in the center of it that it's actually creating these galactic fountains of material streaming out, um, as seen in this Hubble image. And even more energetic, is what's happening in the center of this galaxy, Messier 87. Right here in the center, there's a supermassive black hole. This is a black hole that's probably you know, about a billion times the mass of our sun. 
Okay, this is incredibly energetic, and it is actually spewing out a jet of charged particles, and you can see that jet streaming down here. Right, and these jets of charged particles stream out across interstellar space. I mean, the supermassive black hole is about the size of a solar system, but it can actually create jets that in some cases stretch for five or ten times larger than an entire galaxy. And galaxies, we see tons of galaxies. We see galaxies that are in groups, like this one is called Stefan's Quintet. Uh, there are actually five galaxies. You can see one, two, three, four, five in Stefan's Quintet. Although this last one here in the blue isn't actually physically associated with them. It ha just happens to be in the foreground. And the other four are physically associated together. So we get these groups of galaxies, but we also get these giant clusters of galaxies. This is a cluster named Abel 1689. And these are incredibly massive with thousands of galaxies. And you can see all the everything you see here is a galaxy, except for, I don't know, there's like a star here and there's a star here. You can see the spikes on the stars, but everything else is galaxies. And this is so massive that it actually warps space through general relativity. Okay, and you can see these arcs. You see that arc up here, that stringy thing there? That is an image of a background galaxy that's been warped coming through the, uh, the warped space around this cluster of galaxies. As I like to say, this is visual proof of general relativity. All right, so I got tons and tons and tons of things to say, but Hubble has so many really pretty pictures. I just want to emphasize for you that these are not just pretty pictures, that they also have lots of science behind them, and there's so many science stories to tell. All right, and I guess I've told a bunch of them really, you know, thinly, but we're going to tell one story in a little bit more depth, okay? And the story we chose is we're going to call Crash of the Titans. We're talking about these titanic swarms of stars that we call galaxies, all right? And first of all, I want to reset your idea on what a galaxy is, okay? Because this is a galaxy, and you might say, well, it just looks like stars. Well, yeah, it is. It's about 100 million stars or so, but that is a dwarf galaxy. Um, and there are lots of these dwarf galaxies. Here are a couple others. And they tend to have these roughly irregular shapes because they're so small, the gravity doesn't pull them together. And then there are some that actually have relatively regular shapes, but they're elliptical. And this is a dwarf elliptical galaxy. And I like to mention the dwarfs whenever I talk to teachers, simply because these are the most numerous types of galaxies in the universe. Everybody thinks of the grand design spirals and those are the beautiful ones, but these are actually the most numerous types of galaxies in the universe. The meek have already inherited the universe, or as I say, the dwarfs have already inherited the universe. But, of course, these uh, galaxies are li like their bigger cousins. This dwarf elliptical looks very much like this one. That's a giant elliptical. All right, and you say, wow, I'm not sure I can see the difference. Okay, well, let me go back to the dwarf elliptical. You can see all the things you see around the dwarf elliptical, those are all stars, right? Little pinpricks of light. You go to the giant elliptical, the things you see around the giant elliptical, these are all other galaxies, and that gives you the sense of scale. And so you've got a giant um, ball of stars, an elliptical ball of stars, or all orbiting around each other. And these can be the, the biggest and most uh, stars, uh, galaxies with the most stars in the universe. Okay. Uh, other types of galaxies, we've got a, a type called lenticular, where again you see this big sphere of stars, but you also see this disk. Okay. You see this flat circular disk. And that's really what most people think of in galaxies. They think of a galaxy that looks like this one. This one's called the Whirlpool Galaxy, and it's got that wonderful spiral structure. All right, and this is what people think of as galaxies. And that spiral structure can be beautiful in what we call the grand design spiral here, or in this galaxy, I believe this is NGC 3319, uh, you can see that there's spiral structure, but it's not quite so obvious. We sort of call this a flocculent spiral galaxy. It's got, you know, spiral structure but not as wonderfully defined. And then we also have the spiral galaxies that have this giant bar across the center. This is NGC 1300. And you can see there's this giant bar across the center from which the spiral arms uh, uh, emanate. However, the cool thing about these spiral galaxies is if you look at them edge on, you can see just how thin they are. That black layer. That's the dark dust where stars form in the thinness of these spiral galaxies. They are literally flat as a pancake. But that flat as a pancake can be a great clue 
for when there are interactions. Take a look at this one. You can see that there's some warp to this galaxy. Now, we who are of my age remember phonograph records. Uh, unfortunately, the kids you're teaching won't remember phonograph records. Uh, there was a time when my son was watching uh, Toy Story 2, and they put on that phonograph. You remember that, Dan? Yes, I remember. All right. And my son said to me, Dad, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a record player, kid. You know? Oh. Anyways, but I remember when phonograph records used to warp, and you can see that this is a warp of, phonogra uh, a warp of the disk of a galaxy. Now, this is not doing to being set out in the sun. It's instead due to the passage of another galaxy, which sends a gravitational ripple through that disk. All right, And so we see interactions between galaxies. So here, for example, are two galaxies that they haven't started to interact, but they look like they're going to interact. They're getting close, like they're going to interact. All right, And then here are two galaxies that you know, they're smashing right through one another, just slicing through. And after they slice through, they develop these long tidal tails. So here's a tail here, and here's a tail here. The two galaxies, you know, they, the, 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 the tidal forces produce these big, long tails. And then, gravitationally, they know where their centers are, and those centers are going to come back together and smash together and mix, and these two galaxies are going to become one. Now, that story I just told you can be found within our largest press release ever, this is the uh, Hubble's 18th anniversary press release. We did 59 images of interacting galaxies. And for me, that tells a great story of how galaxies come together and smash together. And so how can we get this out to the public? Well, we actually had a computer simulation. And we found that we could take that computer simulation and match it to some of these images and tell a story. And it's really become a powerful teaching tool. So. Adam's going to bring on uh, this movie, which we call Galaxy Collisions, Simulation versus Observations. So this is the computer simulation. And you can see the two galaxies coming together. But I'm going to pause it right there. And I'm going to crossfade to the Hubble image. And you can see that Hubble uh, it disappeared. Ah, now it's starting again. All right, so we're going to pause the simulation, crossfade to the Hubble image, and see that the simulation and, and the observation match. Then we're going to turn time back on in the simulation. One of these galaxies is just going to come slicing through the other, but pause it there. Now, if we rotate that around and look from another angle, you can see how we match this Hubble image. OK, turn time back on in the simulation. Very quickly, at least on galactic scales, we develop those tidal tails, as seen in this Hubble image. And when I say very quickly, I'm talking like 100 million years. Okay? <laughs> and then the centers of the galaxies, well, they know where each other's are, and they're going to start coming back together first. But if you spin that around and look at it from this angle, you get sort of a cursive Q shape. Well, that's what we see in this Hubble image. And finally, those centers are just going to come smashing together. They're going to mix together to become one galaxy. The tidal tails, well, They'll take a few billion years to fall back in. And you can see that we match what we see in this Hubble image. So you can see those five different Hubble images are just one snapshot in a process that takes about a billion and a half years. And it'll actually take billions more for those tidal tails to fall back in. All right, and so I, that is one way that we can show, uh, we can show that the images are part of a scientific process, and that we can give you a good idea of that scientific process using those images. Yes. Okay, sorry to jump in again, but yeah, I, I just have another question I have to ask. And also, I'd like to remind our participants, if you have any questions that are floating around, please feel free to type them in the chat box. But that looks like an incredible amount of work, pairing up these galaxies that have been observed with the simulation. Is that a difficult task? How long does that take? <laughs> um, Actually, uh, we, I did. I was able to institute, write some new code to take my visualization software and match it up to it, and it really took me only two weeks to create that visualization. Wow! Uh, it was uh, something that just fell together so beautifully. Um, I had been doing uh, galaxy collision visualizations since I was up at uh, the Hayden Planetarium, so I knew the stages of them, 
And so I knew what time in the simulation to, to check and try and see, could I match? And then we actually, we separated out all those 59 images into the early, middle, and late. And, you know, since we had 59, it was easier to match uh, a few of them. I thought I was going to get three to match, but getting five was really great. That's really cool. <laughs> okay. So those are the science stories, and we've covered the uh, science stories. The question for you is, all right, aside from showing, showing things like that, how do you get them and use these Hubble images in your classroom? Well, I'm going to tell you that first off, our main website is called Hubble Site, okay, hubblesite.org. Um, and at Hubble Site, which if you want to get the images, you want to find this link called Gallery, okay? You click on that Gallery link, and you can get to our photo picture album, and our entire collection of every Hubble image we've ever released is available to you through our gallery. Okay, if you click on any one of those images, you will get its page, and you can see that the, it has, uh, you know, small, medium, large, and extra large sizes, right? The sort of things that you might look at on your screen. But I also want to note that we give you the highest resolution available. So every single pixel we astronomers work with in these images is available to you through Hubble site. All right, so if you want to create a really cool, this one image here, you can actually make a six foot long mural out of it. It's got so many pixels in it. All right, so you can get the images, but since you want to do teaching lessons with it, what you really want to go to is our amazing space website. And this is where my colleague, Mr. Dan McAllister comes in. And I'll let Dan take over talking about the amazing space website. You know, when I, when I listen to Frank, always, um... I get excited by things, and I, I'm hopefully those of you out there are into the fact that you're looking at some pretty amazing images and, and stories. Where is there a website for educators where the images and the stories come together and you can actually make use of in your classroom? Well, here it is. In fact, Frank, if you, we go to the top of the page, everyone would find this website a pretty interesting place to go to. Yeah, no question both about it. teachers and students. Yes. But, but yeah, if we, if we click on the other side for educators and developers, this is where you want to go. Click on there, and this is what's going to happen. Teaching tools. The fact that we have all kinds of interesting tools uh, that might be of interest to you. Um, and so. you, can, you can see those, and you can see... Well, we've uh, got the teaching tools, the astronomy, astronomy stuff. Basics, that's right. All right. And then the resources. The resources that are available. But we want to talk about the teaching tools, right? Let's talk about okay, the there tools. you go. And... We have this website organized in lots of different ways by topic. If you're interested in black holes, kids are always interested in black holes for some reason. The whole public is always interested know, in black what holes. Is it about that? <laughs> anyway, there is a whole section there on black holes. And yes, educators, you know, I know they're looking down below and they see tools by type. Oh, this is interesting. Graphic organizers, questions, videos. Hmm. Let's take a look at some of those All right. possibilities. And as you can see, you might recognize graphic organizers. Here, Frank was talking about galaxies. We're comparing galaxies. Um, and you can see that this is one particular way of doing it. Uh, there, there's a PDF file where you can print this out, and the students can actually do the research on their own. But there are other kinds of things. What, do you, what else yeah. do you want to say about this? Frank? I was just going to say, you know, I mean, this is what I was doing off the top, off the top of my head. But here gives you all the this yes. specific ideas exactly. to really work with it. Yes. But I love this one. Oh, yes. The Venn diagram, the classic Venn, where you have similarities and differences. And, and commonalities, and right. Common, yes, no question about it. And, and that definitely is one that uh, uh, brings out all kinds of possibilities and I think excites teachers and students alike. Uh, this is the key core component of our entire website. It, it, it's a theme that, that goes throughout, the misconceptions, the fact right. that myths... And realities that so many people have mis uh, misconceptions about. And we astronomy. do this so many so many times in our uh, teacher training seminars. Yes. That you know the kids will have these amazingly strange ideas about the universe in their heads. Yes. And if you want to try and add in the to the new information, but if you add new information on top oh. of bad information, you're not going to su succeed. And so I love this part of the website. Yes, and it's something with each of the themes, uh, whatever the topic might be, in this case, the solar system, it does present some ideas that you might want to consider using with your students. Ah, when we went out and we, actually we, meaning uh, the folks in the education group, we traveled across the country, we asked teachers, Frank, 
what are the things that they really like about NASA? And guess what they said? Oh, I'm sure they love our pictures. The images. They <laughs> love the images, Frank. And one of the things that's available on, on our Amazing Space website are these lithographs. In fact, we have a ton of them, as oh, you can see here. We have a ton right? of them, and this is one of your favorites, Frank. This is one of my favorites. Why this is this one of your favorites? This is one of the most important images Hubble has ever taken, the ultra-deep field. Yes. Okay? This sees more galaxies at greater distances across space and time than any other image that has ever been taken. Um, and then you look at it, it's kind of, you know, you, can you really make pull that out from well, just looking at the image? We asked teachers about these images, and they said, yeah, what? we like them. We put them up on our bulletin board, but we need more information. Well, then you turn it over on the back, and what do you get? Oh, my goodness. All kinds of interesting <laughs> things there, Frank. Plus the fact that there is uh, information for teachers, standards or standards based information, uh, inquiry, ways in which you can make use of this particular image right. and what it's all about. So just to clarify for people, this is the front of the lithograph. This is the back of the that's lithograph the yes. with all the information yes. about it. And, and then, this down here is a teacher exercise, the, teacher. That they, the classroom exercise they can right. do with it, right? That's the background information. Okay. The teachers and I see that they got instructions for the that. teacher and yes. instructions for the student. Exactly. As well as these national standards, which teachers you guys feel comfortable with those kinds of things. Right. And that makes it useful. Yes. They know what national standards they're hitting, right? Absolutely. So I think you guys do a fantastic job with those. Thank you, Frank. All right. Moving this on. I love. This is one of the <laughs> things that I really like. Another thing that teachers mentioned to us, they said, you know, with all this testing that's going on, content reading is something that we really need to teach. We provide something called the Star Witness News, and it is science information. Science information uh, presenting the kind of a weekly reader for yeah, that. Yeah, like we used, mm -hmm. used to do time for kids yes, and stuff yes, like that, right? Exactly. All right. So, how many of these we have? Oh my Dan? goodness, we go back 10 years. Take a look at this. <laughs> so, those educators out there, there are all kinds of interesting Hubble Space Telescope uh, stories that you might find of interest that you can use with your students. Let's look at one of them. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is a classic one. This is the deep field. The deep field again. And uh, it's a kind of thing that for those educators that are interested in the readability level, we're talking about upper, upper elementary, maybe middle school level. And uh, and what's what's cool about this is this is online, so we can not just look at the deep field; we can really look at the deep field. Exactly. Oh, I love this part. This is the zoomer fire part, and and within some of the stories that are available, you can take a look at the image. The student can, and they can use the zoomer fire. Okay, so we've got like what thirty six million, forty million pixels here. It's a, it's a right. lot. I know that. Frank. All right, so no what are we going to do with the zoom okay. fire? That little object in the bottom right hand okay, corner, let me click on the it. yellow one. See oh, that yeah. yellow See one that there? One? Yes. What does it look like here? Just a blob. Well, it's just kind Ooh. of a blob. But oh, wait, that's... the students can use their zoom fire, and suddenly they can bring it up closer to them. And, and we're not anywhere near close. We're not there we close, go. Frank. Wow. wow. And that brings out the wow effect and brings out students asking questions because that's what education learning is all about questions I, and this is just a tiny region you can zoom exactly. like to this across all 40 million pixels of this image yes all right you can really explore it and but look, we haven't shown them what the start with the print the print, print oh yes product teachers like. are going to love this okay. so if you know you have access to a computer great but guess what if you only have one computer you, all you, these are all in pdf files you can print this these articles out and the students have a copy of the story themselves, and they can make use of in their classroom, which is kind of cool. Yep, and um, you know we're able to uh, sort of get uh, astronomy into the classroom by uh, uh, by English class, by Science the reading materials content and such. Reading. There and you that's go. the kind of thing that the educators out there are in interested in. Can we find something that's relevant, something of interest? And I think this is one example of that. Okay. We got another one we want to go through. Oh, I love this one, Frank. Let's, we're continuing our oh, deep field. Yes, we're into survey. the deep field theme. <laughs> this is called the Hubble Deep Field Academy, and this is uh, something that's used by many educators and students across the country. Let's do it. Uh, and so this is inquiry right. based. Yes, it's inquiry based. Uh, the students uh, look at, or the educators for that matter, look at this image. Now this is the Hubble Deep Field, not the Hubble Ultra this, Deep Field. We've been looking field. at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but right. this is just based on the. The, the deep field, which was done in 1996. It's an earlier version of the same version. idea. Okay. And, you know, the, the students look at it and they say, what are these things? And they formulate questions. What are the objects? I mean, the, the questions that come up, why, why do they have such unusual shapes? 
why different colors? How far are they? How many objects are there? And, you know, this is the basis of where you start in scientific research, is that you have to know what questions you're trying to answer before you go about this. You know, I wasn't schooled in the education of what inquiry method is, but it just follows along the exact same things we do in scientific research. And the first thing is, let's start with some questions. And that's exactly what they're doing here. Okay, so then we're going to explore those questions. Let's explore it. And I how, guess many the, how many is the first Yes, area. and you can see we have, what, three different cameras. Yeah. And we did this activity together. We, which right. camera did we pick? I think we chose camera, camera A, okay? okay? okay so you have to right. choose a camera. So we pick a camera. All right. And the, this particular camera has a, these objects on it. It's broken into, what, 12 sections? 12 sections, and we and chose a section, we right? And cho we choose one of the sections. All right, we chose section six. And then we get six. really detailed, and we look at the objects, and we tr try to make an effort to count the number of objects that are, are within this particular field. Right. So, we, so we can't count the whole image, but no, we, we can can't. count a small section of it. A representative okay. sample. Representative sample. Okay, great. All right. I think we got 48, didn't we? I think we did. Right? Okay, so where do we go from 48? All right. Hmm, that's interesting. So we take 48 times the number of sections of this particular sections. camera. Yep, okay. And we get 576. Okay, and then from there? Hmm. We multiply times the number of cameras. Okay. And we get, what, 1,728, an interesting number. So that would be our estimate for the number of galaxies in the entire image. Yes. Right? Yes. But we can take it one step further, right? Really? We can go further. I, I mean, remember this. We think this about how big is this image on the entire night sky, right? Is it very big? It's not very big. How big is there it? There are 30 million patches of the night sky as, as big as this. Wow. So we've That's got to take this estimate. Times 30 million. All right. Holy shit. Look at that number. 51 billion, 840 million. I love big numbers. <laughs> this is great stuff. And you know what, what's really interesting about this? That teachers have told us, how can we take math teachers? How can we take math and combine it with science? But guess, guess what? Your world is both science and numbers, math. Exactly. You can't separate the two. No, they're, they're inextricably linked. And you can see that connection here. Right. And it's a really cool way that the kids can estimate the number of galaxies in the universe, and all they do, they end up going from a count of about 50 to an, a number of about 50 billion. Wow. And they can see the logical argument that, that gets them there. Now, is this going to be an exact number? No, it's not no. going to be an exact number. It's a, round, no. it's, it's a rough estimate. No. But this really does show you that you know, there could be 50 million ga billion galaxies out there. That's cool. All right. What else are we going to do oh, with the, boy. the deep field? You guys, you scientists here at the Institute, you love, <laughs> to, you love to organize and classify things, don't you? Well, how else are we going to talk about something exactly. unless we have categories exactly. to talk about? And with this Hubble Ultra Deep Field, I mean, there are all kinds of possibilities. We just, we've decided here to categorize them and, and by what camera? Well, well, you have to choose a, ca a camera again. Yeah, well, I think we chose right. camera we A again. Pick a camera. And right. With the camera, this time we're looking at specific objects okay. and uh, there's a number that correlates with it all right and, and then the we students, want to classify them yes yeah, students working in teams and i've done this a lot with, with students uh, middle school and even upper elementary school and they look at the objects and they determine what shape and what color matches up they put the number in and it leads to some really interesting discussion on their parts and then they share their information with other teams. Right, so you got to compare your information. Absolutely, that's an important so, part of science. In the online exercise, they sh they give you this astronomer's chart. They say, "Oh yeah, for these things." The answer sheet. The answer sheet. Oh, isn't yes, that that's yes. reassuring? Isn't it? Frank? <laughs> yes, that there's always answers. Absolutely, but no, it's not reassuring. No, it isn't reassuring because Dan and I like to do this. Mm -hmm. like yes. <laughs> We like to tell everybody that science isn't about getting the right answer. Exactly. All right. Science is about what you can justify from the data. Okay. So I sort of hate this. We have to put up an answer sheet because it's, you know, know. people have I to know, know, know what we guessed at. But those aren't necessarily the correct answers. Okay. If you can see, oh, is it orange or is it red? The outside is, is, is orange, but the inside is white. Okay, um, you know, what shape is it? It's more circular in the center. It's more oval toward the edge. I mean, and, and that's what's so neat about this activity when I've done it with students, the fact that there were disagreements, that they didn't always disagree. 
agree on things. Do scientists always agree on things? Never. Okay, scientists are known to be the biggest argumentative folks around. Okay, and that's what's in this yellow circled paragraph here, saying, "Look, you know, we're supposed to disagree, and it's the discussion about why you disagree that's almost more important than even getting the answers themselves." Okay, not looking for the correct answer. All right, so we've done the the Hubble Deep Field. We did uh, uh, counting. We did classifying. Uh, I guess this one here is the is the one where they actually get to understand what the astronomers think and why we structured the uh, why we structured the lesson like this. So they've gotten a taste of our website, Amazing Space. Yeah, they've gotten they, they've, a taste they've of seen they've seen something about. Well, you're going to review some things about. Right. We're well, going to look at. We, but they, they've seen science content reading. They've seen the connection between math and, and science activities. And English they've, and science? Yes. And they, then they've classified things and organized things. We're good at that. So English. this is a, this is sort of our summary slide. Yes. You can see up here uh, the Hubble site and our gallery and our amazing space and our star witness. We got a ton more cool well, things on all these more. websites that we, we didn't have time. time. Unfortunately, uh, we don't. Well, we'll. I do a video podcast called Hubble's Universe Unfiltered where I explain yes. the universe. Uh, uh, there's plenty more of these 3D visualizations. We've got well, telescopes on ground. I, okay, yeah. I love that one, Frank. I love that one. If any of you with this, I mean, this is a theme with telescopes, isn't it? With this astrophysics thing. Right. So, by golly, you have to go to this particular one. Complete history Tele of telescopes you know, from in Galileo leading up to, to you know space telescopes. A lot and of it, flash interactive. Uh, yes, things those kinds play of things with. that you just saw. Uh, and I one of our most popular things is the uh, the PDF of this electromagnetic spectrum yes. poster, you know, helping understand all the various wavelengths of light. All right, so there is a ton of stuff on the Amazing Space and the Hubble site websites. You can take Hubble and its observations of the universe and bring them into your classroom. You can bring real data to your kids and help them understand the universe. Anything else, Dan? I don't know. I just look at that image, and it just I, I just, just get excited. The chill goes up my arm here as I think about all the things that Hubble has done in the past 23 years. It's remarkable. And it's still working. It's still doing it's its still thing. It's still going strong. still going strong. So, Adam, do we have more questions? Uh, yeah, I've, I've noticed some interest popping up here in the chat, especially around the star witness that you mentioned. Um, is there a way that students can sign up for that and have it emailed to them every week? And you mentioned a podcast as well. Well, it's it's available on the website. And it's it's not something necessarily that they can sign up for. But if they go to the Amazing Space website, periodically they will see current stories. The current story, I think, is about Pluto and and the newly discovered moons around the fourth and fifth moons, yes, uh, Styx and Kerberos. Yeah, so we try to be somewhat current in that sense. That, uh, but again, whoever it might be out there, check out Amazing Space. We, but the thing is, we don't produce Star Wars news once a week. We produce mm -hmm. it, you know, once or twice a quarter. Yeah. Uh, so we will have new ones uh, on order. What, maybe six a year? Um, I don't know. Maybe yeah. so. But there, about there are new stories, and you can see that. When we look back, All right? Because we have a new one coming out this month on Horsehead Nebula. Oh, right. Okay. Um, that'll be cool. Uh, we do not have a, as far as I know, a mailing list for our Amazing Space no. uh, productions, which I think we should do. That would be a good. That idea. would be a really cool thing. It sounds like in good the meantime, suggest. everyone should just set it as their homepage and, <laughs> and leave it. Leave it as that. Yes. Yeah. The Hubble's Universe Unfiltered um, video podcast is available through Hubble site. Um, I think the best way to get noted about that is follow me uh, on Facebook or Twitter. Um, uh, we, I believe we do have an RSS feed for those. All right. Other questions? Um, we do have a few more minutes for questions here from our participants. So please, I, I encourage anyone to enter a question in that's been floating around for you, be it about the resources or about the specific images that we looked at today. Uh, but while you're taking a moment to type those in, I also want to launch an evaluation link on the top left-hand corner of the screen and you can click that little yellow evaluation button when you're done with the session today which will be in just a few more minutes and it will launch a survey in your web browser we would love to get your feedback on today's session to help us shape future sessions and to hear what you thought about the resources that we shared today and over the course of this conference now I saw Mary DeSalt uh, comment on the micro observatory um, and the uh, use of uh, telescopes from ground up Yes. That was one of the things that we wanted to make sure we included because I know you've done the previous two sessions and a lot of it has been 
th thinking about using telescopes, uh, the history of telescopes, that we were coming into the International Year of Astronomy, and there wasn't a really good teacher-friendly, student-friendly website about the history of telescopes. And so that's sort of why we, we launched into doing that back in, what was 2007 we did that? It's been a while. 2007, 2008. Yeah. And uh, so it really does have a great history, understanding the, the ways telescopes work, working from you know Gal the simple refractors of Galileo to the reflectors that started with Newton on up to our multi-mirror telescopes and our space telescopes. And it uh, gives you a good overview. And what's interesting about that is each one of those that you mentioned has a story to tell. And sometimes science is, are some it's in, interesting stories because about yeah. real people doing things. And I think it, you know, telescopes from the ground up provide it has a lot stories. of the stories, uh, the, the historical background yes. of the, the people who did this. Exactly. So that's, uh, that's something that um, somebody out there might be of interest to, to, to doing. Um, I see that John from Massachusetts is wondering, when was this picture taken? And, and Mary added, I think the picture of Hubble might be from one of the servicing missions. Is yes. that right, Frank? That is definitely correct. This is one of my favorite images to, to finish with. This is after they released Hubble. I believe it was servicing mission 2 or servicing mission 3B. Actually, I think, no, it is servicing mission 3B. Um, and after they released Hubble and the space shuttle is moving away from the telescope, uh, gaining distance from it, they turned back and got this gorgeous shot of it uh, over the horizon. Again, you see the uh, very thin atmosphere of Earth that it keeps us alive. Um, but I love it because it's Hubble looking out into the universe. There's a very promising look that it's, you know, just its curiosity is extending out into the universe. Um, and we hope that it will hang up there for maybe in a uh, through the end of this decade and maybe a bit longer. That would be nice. And can you tell us a little bit more, what is a servicing mission? Ah, right. So Hubble was launched in what we call low Earth orbit. You can see the height it is. It's about 600 kilometers or 350, 360 miles above Earth's surface. And that is an, a, a height to which the space shuttle can go. It's actually at one of the highest altitudes the space shuttle can go. And so that allows us to go in and repair and fix and upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope. So every instrument on Hubble that was there when it launched in 1990 has been pulled out and replaced by a new instrument. They often refer to it like, uh, in the old days we used to upgrade your computer and you'd pull out your old CD-ROM drive and you'd put in a new DVD-ROM drive. And you'd pull out you know, the old motherboard, you put in a new motherboard with a faster processor and more memory, right? Well, we can do that effectively with Hubble we can pull out the old scientific instrument, put in a new scientific, upgraded scientific instrument, and you know, when you, you used to feel like you have a new computer after an upgrade, well, we feel like we get a new telescope because the capabilities of Hubble are significantly greater than when it was launched in 1990. And so that's why we can continue to do cutting edge science 23 years after the telescope was launched. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Frank and Dan, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, um, but this has been absolutely wonderful. The, the pictures that you shared, the stories, the resources, um, we hope that those are useful to everyone who joined today. And please remember, we even recorded this session, so you can go back and review snippets from it as we post that archive on the conference site. And we hope you'll follow up and check out a lot of these really cool, well-organized resources that we all know exist now. And we will say that um, we always, uh, teachers always ask for our slides. Can we have your slides and your images? We give them to you. You can post them on the website, and they can, they're happy to download and share them with teachers, actually with everybody. That's great. Yeah, and thank you for the reminder. When we post this recording, you'll actually have a little link where you can download the slides that we looked at today. So if you love these images, then they're just one click away. So once again, please click on the evaluation link before you leave the session today. Uh, a final Thank you to our presenters and to Mary who joined us remotely and for answering so many questions in chat and sharing her thoughts throughout. Uh, what a wonderful end to this series of sessions on astrophotography. Thank you again. Thank you very You're much. Welcome.